Hello. So we're going to start the year with a short story unit because short stories are short, they're sweet, they're fun to read. And I know that you have a background in reading these types of stories. And I also know that you have a background in many of the literary devices that we will talk about and apply to these short stories. So I don't want to take precious class time reviewing things that you already know. So you will see some mini lessons recorded and posted um, in a digital format so you can go review them at home and we can reserve class time for doing actual work rather than you working on worksheets at home in your free time. So each of these videos should take only a few minutes to watch. You might want to jot down some notes, but you do have a list of all of the literary devices in your binder that I provided for you. It might be wise to go ahead and get that out so you can look at the different definitions. You might jot down some notes next to them. Um, the, the ones on your paper are in alphabetical order, but we're gonna talk about the literary devices that we will be applying to the short story called The Gift of the Magi. The first term we're gonna talk about is allusion, and that is a reference to a statement, person, place, or event from literature, history, mythology, sports, politics, science, or pop culture or in the case of the book that we're going to be reading, um, the Bible, which is often referenced in literature. So the author is kind of expecting you to know what these references are so you can understand that in the context of the story. So for example, this says, although not a face that would launch a thousand ships, she had beauty, a beauty that stemmed from her soul rather than her skin. And this phrase here in red, that's a reference to Helen of Troy, because the story goes that when she ran off uh, with her boyfriend, her husband was so upset about this that he got a thousand ships together and took it over to Troy, and that started the Trojan War. This one says, in a fight, he was more ruthless than Genghis Khan and the 1968 Minnesota Viking defense line combined. So you would have to know about Genghis Khan, who he was. And you would also have to know about the 1968 Minnesota Vikings in order to understand how, how um, ruthless this person is. So next we're gonna talk about protagonist. And the protagonist is always the main character of a literary work and it's just he or she would be the center of attention. I always get people who wanna tell me that the protagonist is the good guy. That's not necessarily true. It's often the case, but sometimes our main character can be a bad person. But I want you to look at this prefix here, this word pro. If you're pro something, you're for it. For example, if you are pro snow day, you are for snow days. If you are pro winter break, you love winter break. So this is the person that you are supposed to be rooting for in a story. So if you've ever seen the Peanuts cartoons, we're supposed to be rooting for Charlie Brown or Superman, right? We like our superheroes. On the flip side of that, we have antagonists. And the antagonist is the character or force that's in conflict with the main character. So it's the situation or the person who's creating a negative situation for a main character. Look at this prefix right here, anta. It also sounds like anti. You're anti something, you're against it. So this is the character against the main character. So think about... Lucy here. Every time Charlie Brown goes to kick the football, she yanks it away at the last minute, thus causing him some conflict. Or Lex Luthor. He's always trying to get Superman to lose his powers of kryptonite. Next, we're going to talk about irony. In the general sense, irony is when language or situations are inappropriate or opposite from normal expectations. And there are three types. The first type is situational irony. And that's when expectation is different from reality. So readers and characters expect one thing, but in reality, something quite different happens. We also have dramatic irony. And that's when the character perceives their situation in a limited way, while readers and other characters see things more broadly. That's kind of a complicated definition. In a simple sense, it's when we know something that the characters don't. For example, if you've ever seen a horror movie and you know the serial killer's in the closet, so this sweet, innocent young girl walks into her room, and we're like, no, don't go in there, don't go in there. So we know she's going to get hacked to bloody pieces, but the poor girl doesn't. Next, we've got verbal, and that's actually a type of dramatic irony, and that's where what is meant is different from what is said. And it's not necessarily sarcasm. Sarcasm is a mild form of verbal irony. So for example, if I say, 
oh, I'm toasting to your long life, right? I'm toasting to your long life, but I plan on killing you very shortly. That would be verbal irony. That's not going to happen. Next, we've got point of view, and I'm sure this is very familiar to all of you. Um, and that's per the perspective from which a story is told, essentially, who is our narrator. So in first person point of view, it's told through the eyes of one of the characters, and you will see the pronoun I and me. In third person, that's when it's told through the eyes of an outside observer, and there are two types. The first type is limited, and that is when the focus is on one character, and that one character's thoughts and actions and words. Then we also have omniscient. Omniscient means all-knowing, so we get the thoughts, behaviors, and views of every single character in the story. There's also dramatic, and that's when the story's telling is like a play. So you would get the reporting and the dialogue of all the different characters. I know you've probably heard of second person point of view. That's where the pronoun is you, 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 you. Um, unfortunately, not much literature is written in second person point of view except for choose your own adventure novels. And you don't read those much past elementary school. Next, let's talk about setting. Setting is where and when a story takes place. I often have students identify the where, Frequently, people leave out the when, so it's very important to have both the time and the location. And setting is really important because it dictates the plot. For example, you wouldn't have certain events happen in the past that would happen today, and vice versa. Since we're doing a short story unit, let's define short story. Short story is a short, concentrated fictional narrative. And lastly, let's talk theme. So theme is the central idea in a piece of literature. It's essentially what the author wants you to know or to reveal about the subject. And it should be in the form of a statement. So for example, the word love cannot be a theme. You need to be making a whole statement about how this concept of love plays into the story. So there are five rules that dictate theme. It must be a complete sentence. It must be a universal statement. So what that means is, could you take this theme out of the context of the story or the novel, and could it apply to other situations? It should not be in the form of a command. So for example, people should be kind to others. Um, also, no personal pronouns like I, me, and you. And lastly, you want to avoid cliches. An example of a cliche is the apple doesn't fall far from a tree. A cliche is an expression that you hear over and over and over again. So these are the terms that we're going to be applying to the Gift of the Magi in class. You might also expect a little quiz just to see how familiar you are with these terms so you're able to apply them properly to the story. Feel free to watch this again. Feel free to follow my YouTube channel. You will have lots of lessons and updates here throughout the course of the year. If you have any problems or issues, please feel free to email me. Thank you so much.